Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name's Adam. I work here at Over It. And if you don't know, Over It's a digital marketing agency, full service. And sometimes we like to throw a fun talk and or party. So welcome to that. And uh, if you like to see some of the previous parties, talks, uh, you can go to our YouTube channel or overit.com. There's plenty of that. And we'll be hosting more. So if you do like free breakfasts, uh, in November we'll be uh, hosting an event here talking about uh, job recruitment and retention. But uh, today, um, maybe maybe a little more funny fun. Uh, start off introducing Michelle. Michelle's a founder partner at Over It, a general magnet of all things awesome, forward thinking, crazy things. And you're going to witness her magnetism today because she brought Matt. So Michelle, you can take it away. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was setting me up. Where's, where's Matt? Is he coming out? I'm right here. Oh, oh, Matt, there you are. Should I come? That's are, what I are we need. ready? That's what are I need. Are we ready for me? Hi, Matt. Hey, how are you? You have this mug if you want to transfer into uh, that, but ooh. otherwise, you know, use your paper. It sounds complicated. And yeah, like I'll, I know. I'll do maybe, something that'll make me look foolish, so maybe, I'll just stick with that. Maybe hey, messy. <laughs> um, so, so there's Matt Ruby. He, he, uh, he's Wait. awesome. I've been following him a very long time through his path of careerism and then beyond, I think, is what I learned. I love that word, careerism. <laughs> so careerism, the beginning of his career um, that I am aware of, he was the first, one of the, the first employee at um, what was 37 Signals, now called Basecamp. Um, I would assume you were pretty intricate in those beginnings. Sure. Okay. All yeah. right. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, I would I, imagine I, I, so. I like to think so. Yeah. I would imagine so. You know, I have this rework book by I think it's called by Thirty Seven Signals, and there's some stuff just on this back cover. ASAP is poison. Underdo the competition. Meetings are toxic. Fire the workaholics. Emulate drug dealers. Pick a fight. <laughs> and it, this sounds like you too. I don't know if you had anything to do. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote that you with Jason wrote and it. David. Yeah. 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 That's pretty amazing. I don't. I, I, your name's not on the cover, though, but... I, I've noticed that also. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Crazy how that happens. So this is actually a pretty easy-to-read, like, entertaining book with really good advice, and you can kind of pick it up in the middle. It's a, it's a New York Times bestseller. Maybe some of you have read it. But I, I recommend it. I would like it to recommend it more if he was still making some money off of it, but uh, we won't I'm gonna go I'm going to have there. you be my agent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think, uh, and, and then I actually, so I, and then I was aware of Vooza, mm -hmm. which um, if anybody wants to go there, V-O-O-Z-A dot com. And uh, it's like a video comic strip, you know, it was before its time, making fun of basically a lot of things that Over It does or we do in marketing, <laughs> you know, because it's really easy to poke fun at. It, it's, and absolutely you should, you need a sense of humor with these things. Um, so I followed him along those paths too with Vuza. I also got one of your content pieces that you were in a band that was actually, well, you know, you wrote a little wave there, you, yeah, yeah. you know, you did something. Late 90s, early 2000s indie rock band in Chicago, touring Midwest, putting out some albums, that kind of thing. Yeah, so, I mean, are you guys hearing this? He's just, <laughs> wow, right? Plastics Hi-Fi. Available on Spotify if you really want a deep dive. And then I, I was catching uh, one of your pieces this morning on the way down, trying to put myself in this space. Okay. And you said, um, uh, you know, we did that for a few years, and then we realized it was neither fun nor successful or something. We should be having either more, more fun or more success. Yeah. yeah. I like that a lot. Because that's what bands should actually talk about themselves, because sure. they, they fight. Well, yeah. also, like, you start off with one mindset of, like, isn't this cool? We're doing this, and it's fun. And then you start wanting more and more and, like, you know, having these uh, commercial aspirations. And then sometimes it can... the the reason you started doing it can get hazy. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, last night we had, there was an intimate group of us um, from over it that we got to witness his uh, misguided meditation experience, which was really, really special. Um, Thank you. you know, Thanks, Jack. It, it really was. It, it went into this um, depth. Uh, it talked about it was like funny yet so insightful, inspirational. I really, I really Thanks. enjoyed it. I, I, you know, I can't tell you enough. I, I will come again. And I feel like everybody that was here pretty much thought the same thing. So we, we feel pretty special to, to have yeah. that. Thanks for having me. And um, I know, ironically, you're in an agency, you know, like in a church. So much to make fun of right there, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And then lastly, you know, he has this amazing newsletter. Um, well, not lastly, so much more. But he has this amazing newsletter called Rube's Letter. Am I pr mm -hmm. pronouncing that right? So if you go to Substack, you'll find it. If you just Google, you'll find it. It's such a great read. And you can upgrade your subscription to get even more awesome content. Um, so I highly recommend it. Um, so, you know, there's so much, and I think I asked you last night, how do you define yourself? Um, like if somebody, if somebody doesn't know you, not define, mm -hmm. maybe how do you explain yourself? Because I have a hard time doing that with myself. Um, you know, I'm a marketer, but I'm not really, you know, a marketer or a part of me is a marketer, but mm -hmm. you know, and, um, that's the careerism side. And, um, yeah, so. I mean, I tend to, whatever I'm doing now, I usually just say that. Like, first off, thanks for the great intro. It's like uh, you've actually done investigating and followed me for a while and know all that stuff. Like a lot of people just know me as like whatever is happening at that moment. And I've just kind of come to accept that and just be like, okay, well, right hmm. now I'm, I'm telling jokes, so I'm a stand-up comedian. Or in, hmm. like if someone knows me through writing, then I'm a writer. And if someone does know that I was not a band, then they can, you know, but like... Uh, yeah, it's. I, I guess I don't. I don't spend a lot of time defining myself. Just kind of let people dial in whatever frequency they're they're interested in on. Okay. All right. No, that makes sense. Which might not be the best for here at a marketing place. It might not be the best way to market myself. <laughs> might, I, there's some uh, argument that maybe I would do better if I was able to label myself in a more specific way. But I Google. guess I've I've done all these like. I guess, you know, I'm a maker or creator or something yeah. like that, but those also seem kind of generic these days. So, you know, I like making stuff and it takes different forms. And I think writing is sort of the through line through all of it, whether it was, you know, doing music or doing comedy or the show that I'm doing or the newsletter, it's always starting with writing and, you know, having, you know, as a means of communicating ideas. And I think that's sort of like the, the thread that goes through all of it. And, you know, I've, now I write, you know, a lot of it is starts off with notes on my phone, but throughout my life I've carried a notebook with me and, you know, just been jotting stuff down and I've always felt that's sort of like a, um, almost like a lifestyle or in a way of to just be like, okay, just go live your life and have something on you that you can collect, whatever is, you know, this is an interesting idea, I could turn this into something I could do. So just, you know, on a, on a meta level, what I'm trying to do is like, uh, live a life where things that I think are interesting or that I want to communicate, I'm able to capture in the moment and in flow. And then if it sticks around or seems worthwhile, I'll eventually turn it into something. Yeah. Wow. Cause you know, like when you say writer, it's really, you're carrying those, those thoughts and communication out in so many formats. It's yeah. I mean, to me, writing is about ideas and it's just, uh, it's like, okay, that's you, how do you capture ideas and then how do you communicate them? And um, writing is usually the, the starting point, but then it can take different forms from there. So where did Matt begin as far as growing up? And, and what, what kind of group, or were you not in a group in school? You know, like the breakfast club type scenario. And were you funny <laughs> back then? Were you, you know? Uh, no, I wasn't funny. I was never the class clown or anything like that. I was really shy. I uh, grew up in uh, Dobbs Ferry in New York, which is down in Westchester. Um, I'm always saying up in Westchester, so it's nice to say down in Westchester. <laughs> it's un unusual for me. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I was, I guess I was like uh, kind of a nerd and just didn't, you know, I, I just had a, a group of friends who I'd hang out with and like we'd play basketball all the time, but we weren't good. So I don't know if we would be jocks or anything like that. We were just, uh, I, yeah, I couldn't wait. I was in a small town. I couldn't wait to get out and leave and, uh, you know, become someone else. So I, yeah, like high school and, and growing up was more like, uh, when is this done? And when can I leave? <laughs> and then I went to Chicago to go to school and wound up living there afterwards. Yeah. Northwestern? Yeah. And so the career path, the careerism started there, right? So, so obviously you didn't have this grandiose plan to be here now and, <laughs> you know, and so that path move along. And I'm amazed by it because I am so out of my comfort zone right now. I don't like being anywhere in front of an audience or camera. I've always been very behind the scenes supporting the people in front. You're good at it though. You're good at it. <laughs> you know, thank you. I'm, you know, I'm going to turn all red. Um, but, you know, it is. It's very out of my comfort zone. And I feel like becoming, being a writer, usually traditionally you're kind of an, an engineer maybe even? What, what were you at? <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, so out of school, I, you know, what I cared about most was the band. And then what I was doing on the uh, kind of like 
the internet was just beginning to take off. This yeah. is like late 90s and yep. uh, I became a web designer. I started off doing like some graphic design stuff and I liked it and then I the web was taken off and like I got an internship at a web at a internet company, which was a thing back then, <laughs> and uh, started learning how to design websites. And this is when you had to know like HTML and actually get in there and code. And I think that was a good combination for me at the time of like sort of right brain, left brain of like, you know, aesthetic and visual stuff, but also having to make it happen through a bunch of coding and um, kind of more analytical thinking. And uh, what was cool about it at the time was there was no one who had been doing that for like 10 yeah. years or 20 years there was no seniority everyone was just kind of figuring it out at the same time and so mm -hmm. if you were like you know even if you were young and just out of school if you like you know spent time on it and got good at it you could get you know a decent job and get paid and stuff and so um, I was doing that path uh, at the same time as the band and then you know wound up meeting Jason Freed who is uh, one of the founders of 37 Signals and we were working together on some web design projects and then that eventually turned into 37 Signals, which eventually turned into Basecamp. Um, and so I was, you know, I started off designing websites and being a designer. And then as that business started to grow, we began, uh, basically, we never did any advertising. The way we would promote ourselves was by teaching other people how to do what we had done. And through, you know, we had a blog called Signal versus Noise mm -hmm. that, that was yeah. sort of like, uh, started back when blogs were uh, a growth thing and everyone was excited about them and uh, we got a lot of traction with that so so from there I kind of became more of like a media guy at the company of like you know writing doing the blogging we would do videos we would you know conferences writing the books and like a lot of that was like working with Jason and David the two founders there um, on like kind of like collecting you know different ideas that we had you know put out there through the blog or through conferences or through talks or you know whatever else and like okay then then put it in book form and then uh, so yeah, I became a media guy. We didn't really have like a marketing department or it was just sort of like figuring it out as we go. So, um, and at the same time I was doing band stuff and that was, you know, um, kind of my focus, you know, creatively in, in my mind. And then, uh, you know, eventually I moved to New York and, you know, start doing solo singer songwriter gigs and be like I, I don't like this I don't want to be a singer songwriter with like an acoustic guitar and a scarf and all this stuff I was like I like <laughs> I liked being in a band and uh, and at that same time I was living across the street from a place called Rafifi in the East Village in New York City that had amazing you know free comedy shows every night whereas like Zach Galifianakis and David Cross and Greg Giraldo and uh, Pat Oswald and all these incredible people performing in the back of this video store and it was like really cool and I was there and, and that felt more rock and roll to me than any of the music stuff that I was seeing or doing in New York at that time um, and like I think there was always something that had pulled me in of like not that I was funny but I was always very into telling the truth and I you know realized that like funny people got away with telling the truth more than anyone else <laughs> and so for me that was sort of my and I you know I thought like when I was at a party and I was kind of like you know uh, had a few beers or something I was like I don't know I feel like I'm more entertaining than a lot of other people <laughs> you know uh, and from there I decided to try stand-up comedy and then it was like you know some rabbit hole that I fell into like all of a sudden you know comedy just felt like some ivy that grew all over me until it became me or something because it's uh it's a real lifestyle of having to go, especially when you're beginning, going to open mics, you know, like five or six nights a week and just sort of trying to get stage time wherever you can and figuring it out. And, uh, you know, uh, through doing that at night and then doing, you know, sort of the more internet media stuff during the day, uh, I eventually, that's when Vuza kind of came out of like, oh, well, I might not be the the smartest person in tech and I might not be the funniest person in comedy, but maybe I'm the funniest person in tech. Yeah. And like, can I create a show that's making fun of like startup life in the tech world because yeah. there's so much, you know, pretension. And like part of my mindset is like anytime there's a lot of pretension and a lack of self-awareness, that's very fertile ground for comedy. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I think you see that in like the Christopher Guest movies like mm -hmm. Spinal Tap or Best in Show or anytime people have are very like self-important and don't realize like how obnoxious they sound like that's right for someone to come in and make a parody of it um, or satirize it in some way and so that's what Vuza was and then that kind of took out took off out of the gate like our first video got like millions of views back when you know that was kind of like a big deal and 
you know, then it was sort of like, uh, oh, maybe this could turn into something and started reaching out to sponsors and like, you know, that show turned into like this product placement vehicle, almost like this boutique video production ad agency sort of thing for tech companies, where I, which I still do, you know, video stuff um, for clients in that way. And so it's just sort of been this path each step of the way of being like, okay, what... I'm not a big long-term planner. It's just sort of like, okay, well, this is what's in front of me, and this seems like it might be interesting, or this might be a way to make money, or this is like, you know, I'm kind of tired of doing that, and this is some new thing that I'm interested in learning. Is there a way for me to learn and get paid, or am I willing to just, you know, kind of spend that time sucking it up to get good at something? Um, and yeah, it's also like a willingness to be bad at stuff and to fail. I think a lot of people have success, and then they get sort of accustomed to that, you know, sort of people respecting them or a certain lifestyle. And I'm just like, uh, I, I think in my head, I'm always just fine sucking at stuff or just being like, you know, like in my, it, like, I guess the Zen way to look at it would be like a beginner's mind approach of being like, okay, well, this is exciting. You're learning something new and you're growing. And, um, but also it means, you know, sometimes enduring things that uh, other people don't want to endure. And you just got to get over that and be like, all right, well, I guess I'm, uh, doing this awful club in Buffalo and staying at a Motel 6 on the side of the highway, even though I have a New York Times bestseller out, and just being like, okay, this is, this is the lifestyle I've chosen, and uh, the things that I've, I've been willing to leave behind, and the things that I'm excited about embracing. And uh, yeah, it's been uh, an unusual path, but you know, I've, I've enjoyed it. It's, it's pretty amazing. I, I'm looking forward to where you go. Me you too. Know? Yeah, yeah. Who knows? So, and the newsletter, how, how's that growing and for you? And are you enjoying that? Like if you had to, what is your favorite? I mean, I would assume stand-up is, is yeah, the sta favorite. Yeah, stand-up's the best. Yeah. You know, uh, but some of the stand-up comes from the newsletter. The newsletter mm -hmm. really, I think during pandemic was also, that. so stand-up dried up. There was like Zoom yeah. shows, which were terrible. So, I mean, it's sort of like, okay, I have more bandwidth now to, to do stuff. What do I want to do? Um, and the newsletter, like Substack, was starting to like yeah. you know take off. It's like oh maybe there's more. And not that it's a huge money maker necessarily, but it's uh, I find it a great like sort of just having a deadline is valuable. Like so every Tuesday I have to you know it's it's an essay, uh, a bunch of jokes you know, and you know five quotes that I think are interesting from you know things I've read or stuff like that. And uh, I, I think just having that deadline of every week having to generate something. Uh, I also the idea of making something where I'm not worried about getting paid or trying to sell it, just being like, oh, mm. I've, I'm going to write an essay every week and like have it be on whatever I'm interested in. Uh, a lot of the show that I did last night, a lot of that developed out of essays that were in the newsletter. Um, some of my stand-up stuff comes out of things in the newsletter. So um, I think it's uh, I talked about it last night, but in my therapist uh, I was. Uh, giving me advice, I was f complaining about, you know, career stuff or something like that, and her advice to me was like, okay, well, uh, what would you make if you weren't worried at all about getting paid, if you weren't worried at all about what other people think, if you weren't trying to go viral or anything like that, if it was just for you in, like, play mode, what would you do? And to try to get back to that a little bit. And so that was, uh, you know, I think the show that I, you guys saw last night was kind of based, came out of that, and then also the newsletter came out of that. And I think it, it veers you more towards something that's like, uh, I think, authentic and uh, in a way that like, uh, in the long run might actually be the most, you know, commercially viable or, you know, hmm. rewarding approach. But like, in the short term, it's just sort of like, don't worry about trying to sell something. Don't worry about it trying to be popular. What's the thing that's inside of you that you just really want to get out? Um, and uh, I, I think that's been helpful. And the newsletter has been really cool in that way. And then I think it's also, it's a, it's a level of affinity that people have that's different than like just like a tweet or a lot of social media mm -hmm. stuff. I think a newsletter is, winds up in people's inbox every week and I think they really feel like they know you. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like it's led to interesting opportunities, stuff like this. And <laughs> like I also, wrote you out of nowhere? Yeah, yes. <laughs> and, well, it's, it's, it's happened in other ways too, just mm -hmm. like interesting interviews or like, you know, gigs or people like kind of... I, it's, I, it's not like wildly successful, but it's, I think I've, it's been helpful for me to find people who are, you know, uh, fandom is always a weird word, but like, you know, it's like, oh, people who really get me on some deeper level than just like maybe from a comedy special or just from following me on Instagram or something like that. So I, I value that. And, and I think I'm a good writer and it's nice to be able to deep dive. Like, I feel like we live in this culture where everything's got to be so bite-sized that to 
have some format where I can write things that are, you know, more than, you know, 200 words and oh, just yeah. kind of like have like a, a little more thoughtfulness is, is nice and uh, appeals to me. And I think there's other people out there who like it. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I find it almost therapeutic because, you know, it's it, it pokes fun in a way at, at times to what what my my careerism job is, my day job here. And, uh, you know, I pulled this from from your last newsletter because I loved it. Um, dumb and provocative is an effective strategy nowadays since social media is built on the monetization of rage. And it's better to surf a slipstream of hate than it is to be polite and ignored. Yes. <laughs> like, I love that. And, you know, and I, it's like I... Well, just I, for context, I'm talking about Kanye. Right. And people are like, oh, he's crazy. But I'm like, I think he's doing media right. Isn't this what we want? Isn't this what we're rewarding? I mean, same with... You know, I don't want to get it political, but like, you know, there's like acting like a jackass is a really good PR strategy because this is this is how people notice you right now. I've even had it with videos that have gone viral online, like a joke. And I'll be like, ah, this joke went viral. This is surprising to me. And then I'll look at the comments. There's a bunch of people arguing in the comments about whether it's offensive or not. I'm like, oh, right. The opposite of why I got into comedy <laughs> is what is success now. It's for a joke, even. It's like I got into comedy like because I really want to make a room full of people laugh, and now success, at least online, for a joke is like, did you make a bunch of people fight? And it's like this is this is, these are the platforms that we all are swimming in every day, and so it's it's just sort of like you know Twitter is like a cesspool, but mm -hmm. like look at it's a, the monetization of rage, mm -hmm. and if people are making you outraged, aren't they doing it right? But it's like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a fan of this. But I feel like for us to not all just notice it and yeah. have like an understanding of what's happening to us, who's profiting, and what the incentives are here is, you know, it's at least let's try to be mindful of all that. Ironically, we're all still using the platforms. What choice do we have? <laughs> right. You know, like right. the, where do we go? Right. I know it's crazy. Well, hopefully we go more in person because I think. You know, I, I think, you know, if anything, you know, having this group here and doing stuff like this, I think, you know, in community, I think means more than ever, you know, I agree. I agree. In, in these weird times, yeah. you know? Yeah, it's, uh, there's real value in, uh, everyone's trying to find stuff that scales. Mm -hmm. And I think what we miss out on is how much value there is in things that don't scale. Like people, people being in a room together and actually like human beings and like humanity doesn't scale that well. Yeah, and, yeah. But that's why it's valuable. Yeah. So so in this amazing path you've had so far, which I do think there's so many things that are building on each other as you go. Like, I imagine when you were writing Rework that you could easily make jokes about everything you were writing or, you know, I mean, it, it just, it's all like building in your head, you know, because yeah. you're observing and you're, you know, you're in it. Um, is there anything you feel like you wish you didn't do? You, you're sorry you did? You. Hmm, interesting. Well, let me get back to that because yeah. part of what you're saying about building on stuff, there mm -hmm. was uh, a fake website that we built at 37 Signals called Enormacom, which was like I didn't during, see that. Yeah, this was like during the dot com boom mm -hmm. of like 2003, and it was making fun of all like the, the way like uh, tech companies spoke at that time. And then that kind of took off and went viral. It was funny. And I think it was a little bit of a seed to me of like, oh, you're oh. kind of funny. This is good for you. You're able to make fun of the tech world in a way that people like, and mm -hmm. also that there's an audience for it. And so I do think that was like kind of a seed that planted that, you know, Vuza and other stuff I did kind of, um, you know, was a, a reiteration on, on some way of that. Um, and then also just when you're reading the back of that book, all those things, that's the way like, Stand-up comedy is almost like a mindset or a lifestyle. It's just sort of like, what do you have to say that's like provocative, you know, but also, you know, truthful? Or what's surprising and truthful, and where do those overlap and provocative? And if you can, if you can nail something that's all those things, surprising, truthful, and provocative, you're going to have a sweet spot, or people are going to be engaged. You know, like uh, the back, a good setup to a, a joke is similar to like the back cover of a book of like, oh wait, what was that? And just like, okay, I want to hear what comes next. And that's, you know, like the toughest thing with comedy is like just getting people engaged and interested. Like the setup to a joke is like just getting people on the edge of their seat. And then you can have the punchline or take the twist or go from wherever. But it's like, how do you even, in this noisy world that we live in, how do you even get people's attention for like, okay, wait, I want to hear what this guy says next. Um, but to go back to your actual question, uh, what do I regret? 
uh, or do I, I? I don't know if that's even how you phrase it. No, no, it, no, I didn't phrase it. I don't like what, regret. I don't like that word, yeah, actually. I don't either, um, but like. <laughs> is there anything you like, you you know, you felt like, oh, I wish I didn't do it that way. What's or, the difference between that and regret? Oh, I guess that's a good question. <laughs> I guess that's a good question. Well, uh, or, or, or how about reflected on and, 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 and yeah, just, yeah. you I know, think, uh, questioned a bit yourself, maybe. I don't think I spend enough time thinking about my audience or who my audience is or trying to hmm. narrow down to like, I think, you know, part of what you've tapped into here is like this, I'm a bit of a generalist and I have these different paths and like, I f wonder what my life would be like if I was just good at one thing or just had a laser focus or knew exactly who the audience was that I was trying to hit and just like, you know, laser focused on this demographic and like really tried to nail something as opposed to kind of being more all over the place and changing lanes and doing different things. And I, I think that's been better for my soul and, and mm -hmm. my, my creative spirit or whatever you want to call that to be able to, you know, veer around. But then again, I wonder from like a commercial, you know, success standpoint, if I was willing to just sort of narrow down and, you know, be more hyper-focused, if that might yield uh, better commercial results is something I think about. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's that's an interesting thing. Um, is there anything you have planned for the for the short future that that I haven't seen as your mm. fan? I would call myself, I guess. I do. Yeah, I have a new comedy special slash documentary that we're yeah. editing right now. That's called Substance, and it's me doing four comedy shows four Wednesdays one week after another and uh, in four states of mind. So one is sober, one is high, one is drunk, and one is on shrooms. <laughs> and, uh, it's, and the documentary portions are the day leading up to the show uh, of each one of those. Uh, and it's uh, funny and then like interesting and uh, I'm, I'm excited for it and it's hopefully gonna be out uh, in the next couple of months. So uh, look out for that. And how are you gonna release that? Uh, it's interesting, like, this is an interesting topic, I think, in general right now. So it's, you know, we could try to sell it to a platform, you know, and try to make money, but, uh, and so the positives to that is like, there could be money up front sort of thing, and maybe some amount of prestige that would go along with that. But the problem is there's a longer lag time mm -hmm. to make something like that happen, and comedy really doesn't age well, and like, you, know, you kind of mm -hmm. want it out as soon as possible. Um, and then it also limits the viewership a lot of times. Like right now, especially with comedy and for comedians, just being on YouTube mm. and getting as many views as you can is actually like the wisest path because you really, where we're, you know, monetizing or like what we're trying to do is get butts and seats on the road and sell tickets. And so the more people who are seeing your stuff, then the more tickets you can sell. And that's actually, um, you know, sort of a wiser path. So I think it'll probably wind up on YouTube because I think it's really good and I would like to get as many eyeballs on it as possible. Um, and I think it's the sort of thing that people might share and spread. But that said, if some, you know, platform wants to throw a bunch of money at us and, you know, you know, uh, and that's the wiser path, I, I'm still open to it. There's also, you know, with some discussion as we're getting to the final stages of editing, it's feeling like, oh, this is kind of like a movie. It feels almost like a film. This could be the sort of thing we try to get it into film festivals or something like that. But then you also get into the, the time issue. So right now I'm veering towards, I just want the most people to see it as soon as possible. And so YouTube would be the path for that. Um, but we'll see what happens. Well, I, I'm excited to see where that goes. I, um, I, I think I, you know, with all the, the content you have, I would assume a book sometime coming out of you, not with other people's names on it, but actually <laughs> yours. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I've thought about like the, a compilation of essays that yeah. were featured in the newsletter. I also, th so the show that I did last night, Misguided Meditation, that's the next thing that I'm excited to do more of because I think it's, you know, ripe for the times. And for me, it's, you know, sort of like, a level of vulnerability that I haven't, you know, really done before on stage or anything. And I think it's uh, a framework to, it, I don't know if it's a brand or whatever, but I think it could also be, you know, whether it's a podcast or a book or it turns into a series or, or, or something like that, I think is also possible down the road. Um, I don't know if people buy books anymore. I do, but I'm, I, you know, we, I, I know. Yeah. I, yeah, but it's sort of like, yeah. uh, I sometimes I, like there's a military phrase that has always stuck with me of uh, we spend a lot of time fighting the last war. 
how like you know in mm -hmm. Vietnam they were still fighting World War II, and you know how you're you're always focused on whatever the the last battle <laughs> you fought mm -hmm. was. You think that's that's the war to fight, but uh, in a way that's a blind spot of not real. And sometimes, again, this is not something that I think is great for society, but is writing books a version of that of like oh well maybe that's what was happening you know 20 years ago or when I was growing up having a book was you know. Kind of this really cool like uh, thing to do, but if people aren't reading books, then what are you what are you making nowadays? Um, so I don't know if that's necessarily how I feel, but mm -hmm. we'll see. Well, I'm I'm a person that buys like a limited edition little art book because you know that's you know that, that I just love and is beautiful. So I would buy that from you. I would I would buy. Yeah, that. I mean that's also <laughs> no. You're tapping into the same yeah. thing with vinyl or things like people yeah, almost want absolutely. collectibles or something that's like oh well the same way I would want a poster of like this poster doesn't do anything, but I like how, you know, it's like, so, but that's a good question. It's like, okay, can you make it into more of a design object or something mm -hmm. experiential or, yeah. or whatever that's gonna be uh, more immersive? So that's an interesting challenge though to take on, you know? Yeah, we'll talk on that. Cause I think you should, I, I, mean, right. I think, I know. really do. Good I think know. I think you should. Um, you, and so also you, you're like kind of, you, you get some good PR. Right, so that word, but you get really good PR. Is that you doing that yourself? Is that them just catching on to you when you're, you know, called out in different, you know, national platforms? Yeah, are I you mean, trying? Uh, I, I don't. I uh, anything that happens positively, I'm always surprised, and I don't oh, know how it happened. That's amazing. <laughs> that's really amazing. Yeah. I, okay, so I, I know. I, I don't. Ha I don't have a team. I don't have things yeah. happening. I'm, I'm probably like too lone wolf about stuff. Like sometimes I think it would be helpful to collaborate. Uh, more with others and, and that the promotional side of things. But uh, yeah, I'm always surprised when people notice whatever I'm doing and happy about it and confused. <laughs> That's amazing. That's really amazing. So I know there's only a few minutes technically left and um, I wanted to throw a little exercise at you, just, just a couple things and then um, I'll open it up if people have questions. Of course, if, yeah. Your game, okay. So here's the exercise. I'm gonna say a word and you just answer me with a food that you think it represents. Ready? <laughs> All right, yeah. Facebook. Arby's. <laughs> Kanye West. Grits. <laughs> eBay. Peanut butter and jelly. Elon Musk. The, the outer space ice cream, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, like that's the, a good one. The pellets and yeah, then they turn into ice cream one. and then you're like, but this wasn't even good. No, right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amazon. Lettuce. Apple. <laughs> uh, chicken pot pie. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah, for, thank yeah. you. I want to know I've the never, logic. I've never been asked that before. I, I just made it up. I, I, I don't know. I, I like um, it. I like it. <laughs> um, you know, there's a marketing uh, a strategy question where they're like, you know, if, if your, your brand was a person, place, or object, you know, what would it be, right? Mm. And um, I talk about over it being from like Apple in the 90s. But, you know, you know, because that's when I liked, you know, it's like the underdog time before yeah. everybody had I remember the, the first colored IMAX coming out. Yeah. And being like, whoa, something, some, something's going on here. Yeah. We're back, huh? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Screw those Dells, you know? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Well, it was also a real like... Uh, there really was like sort of like this idea that it was for creative people or designers mm -hmm. or people who wanted stuff that wasn't crap, that wasn't generic, that there was, you you were like there, you know, even that Think Different campaign and mm -hmm. like, you know, it's like a lot of bullshit in a way, but also it was nice that someone in the corporate world and like advertising and everything else was putting out a message of like quality and yeah. caring and that details matter and that it's not just this, uh, assembly line of crap all the time. And like, uh, I, I also think it was like an inspirational yeah. time. Yeah. Even the, what Johnny Ive was doing with the design and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, oh yeah. You know, it's, you know, they're doing way better financially now, right. but you know, you feel like you've lost a little bit of that uh, sort of uh, whatever made them special at the, in that moment. Oh yeah, for sure. So I assume someone might out here might have a question. Anyone? Well, I'm really intrigued by your four states of mind project. Okay. Um, were you surprised by the I was. Well, the uh, like, I didn't realize it was like really hard and 
I think in the beginning, I just thought it was like going to be a little bit like Jackass. You know, like, oh, this is a stunt that will help get some views. And then we started doing it. And I was like, oh, this is actually like way heavier. Like the drunk one was terrible. <laughs> like I, I, I blew 0.15 on a breathalyzer, didn't remember anything I said on stage, forgot to tell jokes, almost fell off the stage um, and felt bad for like a week afterwards. And then the shrooms one was next. And then that was like really glorious. And yeah. Um, I'll tell a story about the shrooms one that was like surprising to me. So uh, my mom lived in the Lower East Side, you know, where this venue was. And uh, I, she threw these art happenings in the 60s. And I had known about them. And uh, one of them was called Rights of the Dream Weapon with her boyfriend at the time, Angus. And uh, they produced these events together. And I had found this flyer online about one of these events. Um, and it had like, you know, musicians and, and films and dancers and all this stuff. And I looked at the address of it and it was 85 East 4th Street was on this flyer that was at this art site for auction. And I realized 85 East 4th Street is now New York Comedy Club, the venue that I was performing at and taping the special. And uh, I had known that before, but the week before the shrooms one, I was like, oh, maybe I should mention that on stage. And I was Googling it and I, I found uh, a quote about, I looked up the title of that event, Rights of the Dream Weapon, and found a quote from Sterling Morrison about uh, this time where he was on the street and him and Angus and their friends Lou and John, you know, met up and bumped up on the street and decided to play music together at this event that was happening. And that was my mom's event, Rights of the Dream Weapon. And it was Lou Reed and John Cale and Sterling Morrison and her boyfriend at the time, Angus McLeese, who was the original foursome of the Velvet Underground. And then I noticed that it was the first time, it was a list of their concerts, it's the first time they ever performed together was at this event that my mom produced that was in the space that I was recording my comedy special at. And like, just from doing this project is the only reason I found that out, I wouldn't even have known. And so like, and then I went on stage on shrooms and told that room full of people that, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, got to have that moment and capture it on film. And I feel like uh, that was kind of a sign of what the project was about, of like, you don't always know what the finish, ver to, to be open to where is this gonna go? What is this gonna be? As opposed to like having this rigid roadmap. And it's like, oh, this is an act of making it was discovering what it was. And like, you know, almost like, you know, starting off on a voyage on a boat and then you're actually like building the boat <laughs> as you're sailing to the other side. And, and that's what the whole project felt like. And I think there's like some really interesting stuff that came out of having that mindset. But it was really stressful in, in the moment <laughs> of like, okay, what are we doing here? Because I was like, wait, did I hire people to film me being terrible at the thing that I want people to think I'm good at? Why, why am I doing this? But in the end, I think uh, the, the good stuff and the bad stuff will be good contrast. And uh, it, it was bad comedy, but good filmmaking um, for some of it. So, uh, but yeah, like that, you know, just seeing it all come together in the edit now, like to me, this, it's all exciting and fun and like being like, I took a risk going out of my comfort zone. And I think we're getting something really good as a result of that. And like, it's a good lesson of like, kind of being willing to do that and also being willing to like not have some, I also like, especially when you're in like a, a more corporate setting or the more people who are involved or the bigger something is, the more there's gotta be a plan. The more there's gotta be, well, we all need to, there's gotta be 12 people in a room who sign off on something and th this is the map and this is the timeline. It's the, and like uh, I, a lot of times I think that comes from a place of fear. Um, and really what, what that guarantees is something that's gonna skew more generic. Whereas, you know, the more you can, have low overhead, the more you can do things independently, the more you can kind of like take chances, that's when you can, you know, get more interesting results. Cool. I have, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I hate this phrase, but to piggyback on that, um, <laughs> would you do that event again where the audience was also on mushrooms? Because I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> I, would love that. <laughs> I would love to do that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think, well, it's our, our culture is moving, like, you know, five years ago, it'd be like, what, that's insane, you'll have, everyone will get arrested or something, but now it does feel like our culture is moving in that direction, and yeah, I mean, um, the, the new show that I'm doing that I did last night, like, definitely is, like, I've had, uh, it's typically happens 
at a yoga studio and there's live visuals mixed on the ceiling and an amp ambient music background performed by a musician and then I'm kind of telling this story slash show slash jokes uh, and there, you know, there have been people selling mushrooms at it previously and like kind of getting on that wavelength and so yeah, I think if there's a way to do it like mindfully that it's not, you know, I, I, for me part of the challenge is like I don't want to be a guy like to give mushrooms to people who aren't used to doing it, especially if you're in New York City and it's a Saturday night, <laughs> and then it's like, okay, show's over, out with you, out, out the door, mushroom rookie, enjoy the East Village. That's that's uh, I, I have the uh, for, that that might be a level of responsibility I'm not quite prepared to take on yet, but we'll we'll work on uh, the details. But yeah, I would love to do that. Anybody else? writing thing kind of comes even from the engineering or the coding end a little bit, and, that, and, and to what degree you still reach back to things that you learn from that age, from that age. Like a, I know there's a left brain, right brain thing mm -hmm. that um, so many complex problems benefit from having. Yeah. Um, but maybe there's also the storytelling where of coding, I think, where you're given a starting point and you know you have to hit this plot point, the end or somewhere near the mm -hmm. end. And then you're kind of feeling everything else in between. Um, I wanted to know if that. Makes so you're sense. a coder. He is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I no, I do think coding was like a. I don't do it much anymore, and I was very like you know this HTML and CSS and the very small amounts of JavaScript was as far as I ever got in it. So I, I definitely wasn't like some some great engineer or anything. But yeah, I think there's something. First of all, something either works or it doesn't. And you know, you know, like I, you know, like I have either failed at this task or I've succeeded. And there's something very rewarding about that, especially in our society where there's so much is like subjective and like everyone's like got different definitions or versions. Like, no, I ran this this code and it either worked or it did. there was an error or there wasn't. And I think that is like uh, I'm a big fan of like objective metrics of success. So within comedy, like a joke is people are either laughing or they're not, you know, and I, I love basketball, like, you know, the, the, the team either won or it lost, you know, I feel like so much of our society is we're wrapped up in uh, feelings and well, there's different opinions on this and that. And so like I gravitate towards even elections. I like that at the end of an election, there's like, well, in theory, someone wins and someone loses. <laughs> uh, that, even that's up for debate now, I guess. But um, so I do think there's that that mindset of uh, so to, and then from there to be able to reverse engineer what's working. Okay, so uh, this is something I think coders get, but maybe like other people don't think about. It. It's like okay, this didn't work. Now what do I do? And sort of being like okay, so I've got these you know 90 lines of code. Well, let me take out half of it and try one half and see if that works. Okay, there's no error there. Okay, well now at least I know whatever wherever the error is in this other half of code, and then keep repeating that process of like kind of like okay, let me take out half here, and it's just sort of like this. Pro you you start off with like there's something wrong here, and I don't know what it is, but I'm going to use this like system of logic and removing things until I get uh, until I isolate like okay, this one line of code is where the problem is, and now let me and let me drill down and like look at every single like you know you know the character that's written here and find out what the problem is. And that mindset is like, uh, I think it's really helpful because you, you know that there's a solution there and you know you can find it and it's just up to you to be meticulous enough to get there. And I think there's something really uh, empowering about that in a way of being like, okay, this, and, and it sucks, it's a pain in the ass, but it's also it's like, okay, I can, I can get this. This is on me and I can solve it. And I think that's, been a mindset that has like kind of branched out to other modes of thinking or acts of creation or things like that of being like okay that joke didn't work but like is the setup working is is uh, okay so uh, there's there's maybe a chunk of a, of a joke that's uh, well that part that's not working let's throw that out okay now this part is working maybe we can take that and build off there and go from there and um, I, I don't know I feel like I've gotten kind of abstract with my answer here but um, <laughs> yeah I think there's something 
the flip side of that is that you can get too logical and analytical and binary thinking in a in a like you know if you ever try to talk to a coder about art sometimes you're like okay this is not going anywhere because <laughs> because you get almost into this you know, rigid zero and one mode of thinking and so I think you tapped into it, is like if you can take that and then also bring in this more abstract sort of other side of your brain and kind of like combine those two I think there's a lot of value in that and someone like Steve Jobs you know we were talking about Apple I think you know that that book gets at it really this power of being at the intersection of like you know the humanities and technology if you can kind of bring in that right brain left brain if you can kind of you know get art but then also understand you know the functionality of code and, and bring those things together I think there's a lot of strength in that we good ever anybody else have <laughs> I don't know no well I mean if there's any other questions no okay well thanks guys Thank you for having me. I appreciate it and all the good questions. <laughs> oh, thanks. Get over it.